Now, last week we spoke about this idea that the, uh, the world around us is full of randomness. We look at something and the value that pops out is completely random. We don't know what it's going to be beforehand. And the very simple thing is just to roll a, a single die or roll two dice. And these things are just random. Maybe I take a population of people that are addicted to something. Maybe I divide them into two groups. And some get one intervention, some get the other intervention, and they all stop abusing the substance that they're abusing, and we just measure how long before you know, they, they get going again. They uh, abuse the substance again. You know, how long are, that's going to take, that's a random thing. We don't know what it is going to be beforehand. So things just happen randomly, apparently. And you know, there's this difference between something being deterministic in other words, I know if I apply this force to that thing, I'm going to get that acceleration. There's a law of physics for that that's deterministic. But many of the things in the world are just probabilistic. Either they are deterministic at a very deep level, but we just don't have the science to understand that, and life is basically like that. We are still scratching the surface as to how life really works. Again, that's just too difficult. So what we see is, in, this, in essence, random. And we just want to make sense of this randomness. And usually, we have very nice models. We have these very nice models that we say, well, these random things that we can see, they appear to happen in these kind of patterns that some occur very commonly and some tend to occur less commonly. And we had the idea that this outcome that we measure is this random variable x. Remember, uppercase x, and it takes some little value x when we observe that value, this random variable. And we say there's certain patterns to these things. We had this thing being described by the two dice distribution. You know, 7 is most, like, most probable, and a 12 and a 2 is less probable for discrete variables. And, but then we came to this idea that, well, not everything that we measure in life is a nice discrete value. Sometimes it's a continuous value. And 3.4 is very different from 3.4001, which is very different from 3.4000001. And it just you know, it becomes absurd. There's an uncountable infinite number of values on the real number line. So we can't think about the exact probability of some certain number. We have to think about a range of numbers. Because once again, I just want to remind you, I mean, if I have something like 3.4, and I just say, well, maybe if I put another 4 there, but I want to round things off, that'll still be 3.4. Or if I had 3.3, that will still be 3.4. Maybe my thing, the thing that I'm measuring with can't do more decimal places, but behind the scenes, there is another decimal place. So this 3.4 is not a single value. When, if I use it as, a, as something that's rounded off, there's a bunch of other values behind the scenes, almost, if I can say. Maybe there's a 3, maybe there's a 4, maybe there's a 7. But 3.4 is still, you know, it stands as representative of all of these, but it's certainly not a single number. And so I lose that ability to say that my random variable in this world of randomness takes on a very specific value. So we always have this idea now that it takes on some interval value. And when it came to, the, when it came to this idea of a continuous probability distribution, the most famous one that we spoke about is the normal distribution. We say this is a model of the world, and there's just some things, if I look at them, it seems that the random values that this thing can take seems to be modeled by this normal distribution, such that if I look at all the possible values that this thing can take, some occur very, very infrequently, some seem to occur very frequently, and then as I go away, less and less probable for those things to happen. Everyone with that. Can you see? This is a model of the real world. It's not exact. We had that thing, if, I, if you just take two dice and you roll them 100 times, it's not going to be that nice theoretical 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It doesn't look like that. But it is a model of what would happen if I could do this an infinite number of times. But we're just saying this thing that we're working on, maybe this was, the number of days before someone relapses and takes their substance again, maybe those number of days follow this pattern. That there's just like round about 21 days we'll find most people, and you know, over here we found find fewer people, 
and out there we find fewer people. If we gather enough data and we look at those numbers, we say, oh, well, that looks very, very nicely normal. So maybe the normal distribution is a very nice model of what this random thing is doing. And so it's never perfect. No model is correct. Some are just useful. All models are wrong. Some are just useful. So this is a very useful model because it seems like many things in the world do follow this pattern, this distribution. So we can use it in many places. And today we'll see a theorem where it absolutely works, a proven theorem that it absolutely works. The other nice thing that we saw last time is that this thing has an equation. Just like y equals x squared, if you plug that into a computer that can create graphs, it'll draw a nice parabola for you. There's an equation for this thing that draws this very nice curve. It's such a weird thing. It has pi in it. It has Euler's identity in it, Euler's number in it, I should say. Where does pi come from in the distribution? It's weird, but it's the most fantastic thing because I know that the total area under this curve, if I were to integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity, is exactly 1.0, such that it's now very nice for me. I can think about this as, well, what if I think about this little value x and every value smaller than that, what proportion of random values that is generated by this model, what proportion of them will be less than this little x? Or what proportion of them would be more than little x? Because this thing generates, we say, this thing, this model, is the thing that generates these random values that we see. It's just a, it's just a model. Nothing in, w in the world is that good that, you know, exactly sits on that line, but it's a very good approximation for what's happening. It's a very good model. And I can always think of some fraction of the whole. That area under the curve would be the proportion of values that I would get if I were just to observe this process and it just spits out these numbers for me. If I were to look at all of them, it would seem that this area under the curve represents the proportion of all those numbers that get generated by this process that would be less than this little value. Can everyone see what a distribution is all about? It tells us what proportion of values would I find on that interval. Can't ask for a specific value anymore, it's now just an interval. Is everyone, everyone's happy with that. Okay, so it's very useful for us to have these models of the world. And there we go, there's the normal distribution. And I just want to show you, I mean, there I, I've coded this in, in the Wolfram language, and if I move the mean around, that's all that happens to this distribution. And that's why we say that if this random thing that I'm measuring, x, you know, x just being this abstract idea, a random variable, a function that takes a process and spits out a number, if this number is described by the normal distribution, I know the normal distribution is exactly described by these two parameters. You tell me that value and that value, it absolutely determines what this curve looks like. Okay, so depending on this thing that I'm measuring, maybe it's the height of these aliens, my usual example, is you give me this value and that value, it absolutely determines that curve, and I'm hoping that this model is a thing that spits out these heights of these aliens. It is in charge of the values that I would see at random. It really isn't in charge, it's just my model of what's happening. And if I change mu, so there's the, there's the equation in this language. I can just, don't have to type the whole name or the whole equation. I can just give it that name. But anyway, there's mu. And if I change mu, can you see mu is absolutely in charge of what that figure looks like? So if I were to plot y equals 3x squared, you know, my parabola is going to be slightly skinnier. You know, it's in charge of what the shape looks like. So mu and there's sigma the population standard deviation that's more spread out. Now I'm going to find less values, in this case around 0 or 1.1, where am I? I can't see. And if my spread gets less, my, my standard deviation or variance gets less, of course, now I'm going to find more values close to there and less values out there. The whole thing is, all the time, the area under the curve is still 1. It's always 1. But now, if I think about what's the probability here that I find values less than negative 5, it's tiny. It's tiny. I'm never going to almost, there's always nothing from negative 5 towards negative infinity. 
but you know, if I increase this one a little bit, now suddenly I'm going to find many more values from negative 5 out. So those two things, those two parameters we call them, they absolutely define what this curve looks like. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so that's a very nice random thing. And I think I've got some more plots for you. There's, there is a model. We think that there's this thing that, that happens in the real world. And if we measure it, measure, repeatedly measure this thing, it can take on these values, x. And we say, we think it's modeled by, in that instance, what is that, that thing, this random values that we can find if we measure this thing in the real world. It seems to be described by the normal distribution on a mean of, now this is the one I always use, 100 for the mean and 6 squared or 36 for the variance, meaning the standard deviation is 6. Cool, that's what I say there. I think this is a pretty good model of this problem. I can't remember, that was from children, and uh, I think their, their average height was 100, and the standard deviation was 6. That's what it would look like. I'm, I'm believing that this model is the thing that generates these alien heights or these children's height. I believe that's a very good model. That's the thing that generates these random values, such that I'm going to find most aliens, let's stick with aliens, are going to be about 100 inches tall. I'm going to find, if, you know, if I just measure all of them, most of them are going to be about 100, and fewer of them are going to be at 90, and fewer of them at 80, et cetera, on both sides. Everyone happy with, you know, everyone's happy with that. Everyone understands that now. It's just this thing that I think is a very good model of what generates values for this random variable x. So that's very cool. And now I can start asking that question, since that is the proportion of the whole, I can start asking that question, what is the probability that I select a random alien from this planet and they are at most 92 centimeters? What I'm asking is what proportion of these aliens are at most 92 centimeters? Because if I take a random alien that is at most 92 centimeters, that alien is going to fall somewhere in that red line. But that's the proportion of the whole, of all of them. That proportion of them will be less than 92 centimeters. Okay. But we also said that's slightly difficult to work with. We like to work with a standard normal distribution. We like this one, the standard normal distribution on a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one or a variance of one squared, which is one. I like that one. That one is just easier for me to work with. And I just want to revisit the whole thing for me is just to revisit how do I go from this distribution to this one, which we usually denote with a Z instead of an X. I just want to go again. I just want to show you once more how to go from x to z, and why does that work? Because if I have this distribution, and let's make this problem that, as it is here, this one is at 100, and I'm saying the standard deviation is 6. So what is, give me two values that are one standard deviation away from 100 in this, this example. 100 and? What value on this real axis here will be one standard deviation away from 100 if the standard deviation is 6? 106. Thank you. 106. And on this side, 94. So those would be values that are one standard deviation away from the mean. So what, what we had last time, we said, well, z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. And just as I said, if you ran 100 yards in 10 seconds, I say you run 10 yards per one second. So if I divide by something, it is per one unit of that thing that I'm dividing by. So if I divide by standard deviation, I'm saying per one standard deviation. So I'm just saying, how far is this thing, how many standard deviations is this thing away from the mean? So in 106, we said it's one standard deviation away because the standard deviation is six. So if I take 106 minus 100, that's 6. 6 divided by 6 is 1. So indeed, if this thing was, if this thing was 106, and we just define that as being one standard deviation away from the mean, of course, if I transform it into z, it must be 1. Because that does mean, if I go to this standard normal distribution on 0, that thing must be 1. And this value must be negative 1, because that is one standard deviation away. So that's what we're saying. I'm just doing this very nice linear transformation from this to this, so that I have this nice distribution. Everyone happy with that? Because I think there are one or two questions about that. Everyone happy with that? OK, so that's brilliant. Now I can always, instead of asking, what is, 
well, we said 92, so 92 minus 100 is negative 8. Negative 8 divided by 6 is negative 4 over 3, which is negative 1.75. Arithmetic, you all know now, it's not my best thing. Math, I love that thing. Arithmetic, it's not mathematics. Okay, so that 92 gets there. And asking what is less than 92 is the exact same thing as asking what that area is. Everyone happy with that? Okay, it's just that it's easier to work with. And if we were in the old days and we had to go to the back of the textbook to use a table, the table, there will only be tables for Z. There won't be tables for every possible X that exists in the world. So, you know, we have that transformation to Z. Everyone happy with that? Okay, it turns out we're going to use Z quite a bit. Z turns out to be the standard, and I'm just going to call that the standard normal distribution, and we use the symbol Z for that. So we can say Z is also a random variable because it's this day, you know, transformation from a, a, an X value. But it turns out it's actually much more useful than that, much more useful than this, this simple idea of just transforming it. So let me see if I've got a few more of these. So there we go, just to show you that 92 would be right there, negative one and a third. That's the same area under the curve as that area under the curve. I've just done that very simple transformation. And I can also do you know, what is at most 110. We saw that last week. That would be the same as saying uh, more than, what is it, 1.67. If I do that transformation, or I can ask you a little interval, which we're never going to do. I won't ask you that in the exam. So that was very, very useful. That was very useful to us. But now we've got to think of something very different. Not very different. We're going to use the same mechanics. We're just going to use a different setup. Not only is if I go out and I measure how high you are and how tall you are and how tall you are, what your height is, where this is all random, there are other things that are also random that we haven't thought of before. So other than me just measuring how tall you are, or I can measure what is your glucose level, or asking you how long have you been smoking, Okay, zero days. Huh? Yeah. Okay, these are all just random things. I measure them, I ask you, or I measure them, the up, ups, and down. Turns out there are other things that I don't necessarily measure that are also random. And here we go. What I've done here for you is I've generated this population, but I've, it's a, some, again, maybe let's just say it's a bunch of aliens, and I measured something in their blood, took their blood, and I measured their, this value in their blood. And I created a histogram of that. So I'm just counting for all these aliens that I took blood from. Between 0 and 20, I only found 70 of them. Between 20 and 25, so many. Does that look like this thing is normally distributed? No. Would that be a good model to say that, well, let me use a normal distribution to describe what possible values this can take? Would that be a good idea? It seems not. It seems like this value in this population is not normally distributed. This is the histogram that I seem to have gotten from this population. And so it seems like um, I had 2,000 aliens. This is a planet with very small populations. So I'm just simulating 2,000 of them there. Just going to run this code so that I can show you. Turns out, there we go. Turns out, even if something is not normally distributed, those are the 2,000 values. I can still calculate the mean. Is there anything that stops me from asking you what's the mean of 34, 75, and 189? Can you calculate the mean of that? For sure you can. You add the three, and you, you add them, and you divide by three. So no matter that the thing is not normally distributed, I can still calculate the mean. The mathematics doesn't stop me from being able to calculate the mean. And so it turns out the mean of this thing that I'm measuring in these aliens' blood has a mean of 51 a standard deviation of 19 and a variance of 393. I can still calculate that. Everyone happy with that? It doesn't stop me from, but I can look at this and I say, well, it doesn't look like the normal distribution is a good model for how these values are generated. But I can still calculate a mean, and maybe I need to do something with these aliens, and it would be great for me to know what the mean is. Maybe I can't measure get all 2,000 of them together and take you know, whatever they have for blood for all of them. Um, maybe I can only take 100 of them and check that. 
and maybe I'll use, to use the mean of that hundred of them to think about what it might be in all of them. And that's what we do in research all the time. We take a you know, subset of people, we calculate something in them, and we hope that I took them from the population such that, and we're going to talk much more about this next week, I'm just hoping that this mean that I calculate for this little bunch of them is very close to what the whole population mean is. But the whole population means the one that I'm interested in. Because now you're going to read my paper and you're going to go off to another planet and you're going to use my results on that planet and you're hoping that it's still applicable to these other people or aliens that you're dealing with. Okay. So there we go. I can still calculate this mean. And what I would love to do is just to know something about this mean. This one's very easy. My whole population is just 2,000 subjects. So I can still do that. But let's do a little, a little experiment. And there's my little experiment. Instead of taking all 2,000, I'm just imagining I cannot possibly, and do, do you all see I'm just scaling it down to this weird planet with some weird aliens on it just because I can't do 8 billion. You know, I don't want to tax my little computer, that, my little Apple that much. So I'm just assuming the whole population is just 2,000 members. And now I'm taking a sample of 30 of them. I just go random, I just pick 30 of them. Okay, and I take blood from them and I measure that, them in that 30. So I don't know what all 2,000, what all 2,000, the all 2,000 values really are. Behind the scenes, I do know because I, once, I was the one who generated them and I was very sneaky to generate them that they don't follow a normal distribution. Okay, I was in charge of, of this, this planet. Anyway, so I take 30 of them and I uh, draw their blood, then I measure this thing in their blood. So I've got 30, what can I calculate? I can still calculate a mean. Can I not? I've got 30 values. I can add all of them and I divide by 30 and I get a mean. But now I'm going to be, for the first time, I'm going to again use this word, the frequentist approach to statistics, which is what we do. We do a frequentist approach. And now I'm going to say, well, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and at random I'm going to take 30 of them again and I'm going to draw their blood, and I'm going to calculate the mean, and I'm going to write the mean down. Two days from now, I'm going to wake up again, take 30 of them, take their blood, write down the 30 values, calculate the mean, write the mean down. Now I've got three means. Okay? And a mean for a random variable that comes from not the whole population, but just a subset of the population, so I'm just taking 30 of them, we put a little bar on the top, and we say, we call that thing the sample mean. Okay, but now I've already got three of these means. And imagine I were to do this for a thousand days consecutively. I'm frequently doing it, the frequentist approach to statistics. Imagine, which I can't do in real life, there's no ways you can do a study that the IRB, the, the review board, is going to give you permission to do your study a thousand times over. So I'm imagining, thought experiment, I could do this a thousand times over. So I'm asking you to think that I have a thousand means every time from 30 individuals, from 30 individuals, from 30 individuals. Maybe there's one little alien that got chosen five times. It was just so unlucky you know, that their blood had to be taken five times. There's some aliens that I would never choose by chance, even if I were to do it a thousand times over and I'm just taking 30 at random. Okay? But I want you to think that I have a thousand of these now. Now, I said before a random variable can be something that I'm measuring. I'm taking your blood and I'm measuring your glucose level. That's just a random value. Something I can measure. How tall are you? I can measure. But look, those are random values. But look at this thing. I am claiming that a mean is also a random variable. I chose 30 aliens at random. I took their blood, measured, and calculated a mean. Now I've got one mean. Tomorrow I took another 30 at random. So the mean that I'm calculating, the statistic that I'm calculating, is also a random variable. Because I just took them at random. Who, who, who doesn't agree with me? Who wants to debate me on that one? So now, instead of something that I'm measuring, and I'm saying the value for that thing that I'm measuring, or asking you about is random, I'm saying, or rolling a dice, the value that lands face up is random, I'm saying a statistic that I calculate is also random. Am I going to get the same mean every day? I just took 30 random aliens and calculated the mean for those 30. Is the next day's mean going to be exactly the same? And the next one exactly? No. That's going to be random values. So it turns out that some statistic that I can calculate, standard deviation, variance, minimum, maximum, 
These things are also random variables. They can also come in a certain pattern. Some means are going to occur much more commonly than other means. It's also a random variable. And look at, that's exactly what I've done there with the code. I said, take 30 at random, calculate a mean, save it. Take 30 at random, calculate a mean, save it. And do that a thousand times over. And give me a histogram of all the means. Does that thing look normally distributed? Yeah. It does, and that is a fantastic law of the universe, that it turned out that our universe was so kind to us that this would happen. And there's a theorem there called the central limit theorem. Okay, what I'm suggesting is that even though the variable itself was not normally distributed, I could not use that for that random variable. Turns out if I repeatedly sampled a statistic, the mean in this instance, it turns out that thing is normally distributed. There's a nice bell-shaped curve there. And guess what? On that little red line right at the top, I said even though that thing was not normally distributed, I could still calculate a mean. What was it? 50-something. Who can remember what it was? Yeah. Turns out, look closely at this thing. I've been so kind as to put the red line in again from the population because secretly I knew what all 2,000 was. So I can pop that line in. Guess where this thing is centering on? the population mean. Turns out if I repeatedly sample from this, this thing is going to get very, very close to, it's going to get very close to that thing. That's wonderful. It would be much more likely for me to find a sample mean that is close to the population mean than it would be for me to find, it's still possible for me to find a mean that's very far away from the population, real population mean, but it seems as if they are centering on central limit theorem on the population mean. And that's a very cool thing. Okay, that is a very cool thing. Now, this is called a sampling distribution. Or sampling distribution. I'll say sampling like a good British person. Distribution. Okay, sampling distribution. Or a distribution of sample means. So let's write that. Distribution of sampling means. Which means, which means, before I said it's random, this value that I measure, what's your blood glucose level? How tall are you? Those are random. As I'm saying that if I were to sample and calculate a statistic from a bunch of values, that thing also has a specific distribution. It's a sampling distribution. And look at this. Even though this thing that I'm measuring is not normally distributed at all, it turns out if I repeatedly sample from that and measure the same statistic every time, that thing is normally distributed. Now, this is the central limit theorem. In, but I want you to watch something very closely. How many people did I sample, aliens that I sample every time? 30. I took 30, people, 30 aliens, took their blood, measured it, put them back in the population, say, go home, live in, you know, wherever you live on your alien planet, go back. Next day, I woke up and I take, took 30 again. 30 is what I took every time. And because I took 30, it seems like I was very likely to get a value close to the mean, the population mean, much more or less probable, I should say, for values further than the mean. But look at that. Even though the mean was 50, what was it? What did you say? 50, whatever it was. There were still, look at this, I found a couple of them at 10. That's very far away from 50 something odd, the real value. So it's possible for me to find values at random. It just so happened that that day I got up and by pure chance, the 30 that I selected had very low values. They weren't nicely spread across what all the values are that these 2,000 aliens really had. I was just unfortunate that day that by pure chance, I selected a bunch that had a very low value. And on this day, I got up and I just randomly selected, it just so happened that all 30 that I took had a very high value in their blood for this thing that I measured. But it seems I was much more probable for me to find a value close to this. Everyone happy with that? But what if I could, instead of taking 30 aliens at, on a day, what if I were to increase that? So what I'm simulating in the next one is, uh, let's, I'll skip that for later. There's my aliens again. Sorry, I'm just showing you. 
So there I did the 30 aliens. And sorry, this time around, I was doing something else. So now we're going to say the mean was. Let's just be sure. I've got two examples of the exact same thing here. So there I generated the population. And I generated, this time I've got 10,000 aliens. And it so happens when I calculate the mean of all 10,000, the real mean was 89.98. So let's write that somewhere. So this is a brand new planet with other aliens. The real population mean, mu, is 89.9842. Okay, there we go. That's all of them. Certainly this value on this alien planet is not normally distributed. Once again, I've been sneaky and made all 10,000 of them right there. But I can still calculate the mean there. Cool. So let's carry on. Now, I've taken 30 of them. Uh, no, I started with 10, apparently. So I took 10 of them, but I did it 1,000 times. Out of these 10,000 aliens, I took 10, took their blood, measured it, calculated a mean, wrote it down. Did it again and again. I did that 1,000 times over. Still, even if I only had 10 in my little sample, it still seems like it is clustering around the real population mean. And it's still very less probable for me to find values further away from the mean. Cool? But what I'm going to do now, instead of just taking 10 of them, yeah, I'm taking 30 of them. What is the difference that you can see between those two? Between taking 10 of them 1,000 times and taking 30 of them 1,000 times? In both instances, does it look normally distributed? Yeah, fairly. The sampling distribution of sample means seems to be normally distributed. Everyone get that those are now not the real values that I take from their blood. This is the means that I'm, I've got on my x-axis now. Everyone cool with that? OK. What is the difference between the top one and the bottom one? They seem both to cluster around 90. That's fine. But what do you see? Look at the, the values on the x-axis. That one goes 86 or 85, 94, 95. This one sort of only starts here at about 86 and a half. Well, that one still had a lot of values out there. What's the difference between these two? What's the clear difference between those two? What happened when I suddenly took a larger sample size every time? I went from 10 to 30. What's the thing that changed? It became less spread out. The standard deviation of my means, this is not the actual value, the spread in the means got smaller. Because the only difference is I took more people. I took more of these aliens. Now look at this. Now I'm going to sample. How many do I do there? I take my cursor away. Uh, can I see? Now I took 100 of them every time. 100 right down the mean. 100 right down the mean. And I did that 1,000 times. What happened now? Standard deviation is even smaller. OK? Still clustering nicely. I'm using the word clustering you know, loosely here. Not the true definition of it. But they seem still to be all around 90. So they're still around the true population mean, which we know to be, of all 10,000 of them, we still know to be about 90. It seems like if I were to do this many, many times over, frequentist approach to statistics, this is the distribution of means that I would see. Now my standard deviation is very small. It shrunk quite a bit now. So it seems as if the more people I take in my study, the, can we say the more sure I am? Because it's going to get closer and closer and closer. It's now going to be very unlikely for me to find, I'm going to say not probable, for me to find a value that's far away from the population mean. That now becomes very, very improbable. OK, the bigger I make, my sample size, the more I have this guarantee that the mean that I calculate for this one sample of mine is closer to the real deal, the real population mean. And that's why we always beg for more money when we write grants, because we want a bigger set of subjects in our study. The more people we have in our study, the closer it's going to be. And because in the end, if I have enough time and money, I would just take the whole population. Then I'll know exactly. But it's always much more difficult for us to do that, so we take people. But it seems as though you can see there, the more people I include in my study, the more probable it is for me 
for that mean, for this mean to be close to the real deal. Can everyone see that? Everyone be happy with that. Now, it turns out we have the same story here. We have this sampling distribution of this mean, okay? Turns out I can also go from this to Z. Because can you see I'm still with the same kind of problem? Okay, it's, the mean is that this thing is normally distributed. We all agree with that. So it is going to be described by a normal distribution. I will have a normal distribution on a certain mu and a certain sigma squared. Now, that's not the population mean in the population. That's not what I mean by that. I mean, if I just were to look at this, it seems to be generated by this thing. But in reality, the actual value was not normally distributed. So you see, yeah, I'm talking about the sampling distribution of the sample means, okay? So it turns out that's still going to be, but, you know, if I do some other blood test, maybe that value is centered around 200. So I still have so many of these, and it turns out it's just much easier for us to come back to the standard normal distribution. But now I have just a little bit of a complication. It seems as if this thing was very sensitive to how many people I took in my population, how many people I took in the sample. I'm going to have a very different spread depending on how many people I take. So I have to alter my equation a little bit to go from there, that distribution of all of these possible values to this one. And this, here it goes. It is still x minus mu divided by sigma divided by the square root of n. Turns out there is a nice value by which this thing shrinks. And it shrinks by the square root of the sample size. So the bigger I make the sample size, the smaller that spread becomes. And it turns out there's a very nice relationship between that. And that's that. So last week we just said x minus mu divided by sigma, but now we do divided, sigma divided by the square root of n. Okay, and this whole thing now, because it's not standard deviation on its own anymore, we give it a new name and we call it not a standard deviation, but a standard error. That's just a term that we use, standard error. But do notice that the standard error is a standard deviation of a sampling distribution. Because if I look at that thing, it really has its own standard deviation. Okay? Turns out, though, that it is absolutely scalable by the number of people that I select in my study. It's scalable by this factor down here. And we now call it a standard error. But a standard error is nothing other than the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. It's just very sensitive to how many people I select in my study. Cool. Now, today we're done. And is it very different from what I said last week? I told you, if you understood last week, statistics for you is done and dusted. Okay. Because as it turns out, I can say to you, I, we can describe some distribution of sampling distributions. Now, these are x bars. Sample means. And I can ask you what proportion of them are less than some specific value. Is that not what we did last week when we took the actual measurement of this thing that we measured in their blood? Okay, but this now is not a distribution of the actual value of this thing that I'm measuring. It's a distribution of means as if I could do this a thousand times over, 10,000 times over. Okay, when is it going to get nice and smooth? smooth? If I can do this an infinite number of times, then I'm going to get a nice smooth. Okay. But I didn't do it. I only did it a thousand times, so you know, it's going to be a bit jaggy. And in the end, I've just got a histogram of these things. So it turns out that this thing, by the central limit theorem, will be normally distributed, irrespective of what the distribution of the actual value was. That's not the whole story, though. So let me give you the whole story. There are two things that must be true for me to make use of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem, which says that if I repeatedly sample from a set of values from a population and I make a distribution of the means, that thing will be normally distributed. In essence, that's the central limit theorem. But I need two things to be true. Either, and you've got to write this down because I might ask you a question in the labs, not in the homework, not in the exam, but where one of these two things fail. And the two things that must be there for me to make use of the central limit theorem is that 
the actual thing that I'm measuring in the population must be normally distributed, which we saw it wasn't. So either that one or I must have at least 30 subjects in my sample. Once I cross that 30 barrier, I don't have to have this thing normally distributed in the population anymore. Okay, so one of the two must be present. Okay, as soon as I tell you this thing that we're measuring is normally distributed in the population, then I don't care how many people is my study. Usually we don't know that though, so we want at least 30 people in a study. Because once I cross that barrier of 30, I can start making use of the central limit theorem. Okay, so just be careful when I give you a problem like this. One of those two things must be, must be true. Otherwise, central limit theorem doesn't work. It, 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 don't use it. So are you saying that the sample of the daily study or the population? The, the sample that you take of people from the bigger population. Okay. N must be at least 30, 30 or more. Okay. Otherwise, can't use the central limit theorem. You can still do the math of it, okay. but it becomes, it becomes um, well, you can't trust those results. Yeah, no, no. I'm just saying is I'm going to get a bunch of X bar values. There's all the possible X bar values that I can take. I'm taking each one of them, subtracting from that the population mean, and I'm dividing by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So that I go from that point to the standard normal distribution, and from that point to the standard normal distribution, and from that point to the standard normal distribution. Of course, this one will be at zero now. Just that same transformation I did before. But this time, I cannot do without considering how many people I took in my sample. Okay, I've got to do that. Okay. All I'm saying is, this is all possible X bar values. This one was centered around 90. All I want to do is just to go from there, transform this into one that sits at zero with a standard deviation of one and a standard deviation of negative one. These would be standard errors, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means. Cool. And so now I can start asking you the exact same question. I can say, what proportion of sample means will be less than 88 given a population mean, given a population standard deviation, and given that my sample size is 34? Okay, so I have got to tell you these things. I must tell you what the population mean is. I must tell you what the population variance or standard deviation is. And I must tell you my sample size. If I tell you that this thing that I'm measuring in the population is normally distributed, central limit theorem, you can just go straight to this equation. If I don't tell you, then just make sure this is at least 30, 30 or more. I won't be that nasty. I'll give you more than 30. Okay. That means I can now ask you what proportion of possible means would be less than a mean of 88. Can you see that's the same thing as asking you last week, what proportion of people have a value of less than 92? Okay. But this time there's a complication. This is no longer the thing I'm measuring. It's the mean of a couple of them that I'm measuring. And I would say that if I could do it over and over again, the central limit theorem guarantees that these means would be normally distributed. If I have at least 30 people, or the actual thing was normally distributed. Those things, one of those things being true, done and dusted. Okay. The important one is probably having this more than 30. Okay, then it doesn't matter what, and I showed you an example where the thing wasn't normally distributed at all. Okay, it's still going to work. Or I can ask you, what proportion of sample means would be greater than 100? Would still be just that little area under the curve. So I'm doing something completely different from last week. I'm not measuring something and looking at the distribution of that thing. I'm taking another kind of random variable. This time it's a statistic. Turns out the statistic also has a distribution. But I could make use of the exact same 
thought processes we did last week. There'll be some distribution of them, and I'm just asking for some proportion of what proportion of them will be less than, more than. Turns out the area under this curve, because I've transformed it to Z, would also be 1.0. And I can still ask for what proportion of values will be there. Same thing as last week. And so is all of statistics that you're going to encounter in 6002. We'll be able to draw some distribution, and it's a whole, and I'm just asking you what proportion of values would be on that interval. If you understood last week, then there's nothing in stats that you can't understand. Can you see? Totally different scenario here. I'm, taking, I'm now taking only samples of cases, and I can see, I can see um, what proportion of them would be on some interval. Same mechanics as last week, different setup. And eventually, next will come up, well, why would I want to know all of these things? Because I'm just saying that I don't know what the values are. Here, I cheated. I created the whole population, so I knew exactly what had happened. But in real life, you're going to take 30 people in your study. You don't know what the population looks like. Turns out there's another distribution that is beautiful for if you don't know that one and you don't know that one. We, that problem is solved. Guess what that one looks like? It was also bell-shaped. Okay, and we're going to use exact same mechanics. What proportion of this area would I find these outcomes? The story is the same every week. If you understood last week, you understand statistics. Happy with that? So let's just work through one example. Uh, maybe someone can shout out. Maybe. Let's make... Who wants to come up with a scenario that's slightly different from my little alien? I, I feel my alien planet is safe because then I'm not talking about human beings, which I tend always to do, and which I tend, that I don't like to do. So let's just imagine, what, what can we imagine? Who can look up, because I know millimoles per liter, I know, don't know milligrams per deciliter, what's the normal blood glucose level? What? 80 to 120. So now we're back to 100 being smack bang in the middle. I don't want to use examples, but let's go there. Let's imagine that all 8 billion people in the world have a blood glucose level. And let's imagine that the randomness in that value follows a normal distribution. Let's just imagine that the normal distribution is a good model for human beings' random blood glucose levels. Okay? So if I knew all 8 billion, I'm going to say that the mean, the mean blood glucose level of all 8 billion people on Earth is 100 milligrams per deciliter. Anyone know what the standard deviation of that thing is? What's the standard deviation? Does it say somewhere online? Ah. Let's come up with one and let's make it very easy. Let's just stick to 10 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. That's the variance in the population. Imagine we knew this. Now I'm going to ask you, what proportion of mean values for blood glucose taken from a sample of 30 people will be less than or equal to 95? Less than or less than or equal to, same thing, because continuous numerical variable. I can't think of one specific value anymore. So whether I put less than or less than 95, I don't know. What proportion? So what am I asking you? Imagine you could go out and you take 30 people and measure their blood glucose. And tomorrow you do it again and again and again and again. And you do this an infinite number of times. Okay? I've both told you under our little premise that blood glucose is normally distributed. And we've got at least 30 people in our study. So we, you, know, you only need one of those things to be true to make use of the central limit theorem. So immediately we know that if I were to do this many, many times over, all my means that I could possibly calculate will be normally distributed. It will have a normal distribution. Central limit theorem guarantees that for me. Okay? Now I'm asking you, if I were to do this a million times over, what proportion of those means would be less than 95? You know, some are going to be, most are going to be about around 100. But we saw, though, some will be a little bit far out. And it's even possible for me to find one purely at random very far out. Okay. I'm just asking if I could do this frequentist approach an infinite number of times, taking 30 people, measuring their glucose, calculating a mean, so that I have an infinite number of means, 
what proportion of them will be less than 95? What proportion of means will be less than 95? So that's different from last week. I'm not asking what proportion of people have a glucose less than 95. That's a different question. You see that? Then I don't have to have the square, divide by square root of n. I'm asking if I were to repeatedly sample from this population, 30 people at a time, and I calculate the mean of those 30 values, and I did that an infinite number of times, what proportion of proportion, probability, same thing, of that area under the curve will be less than 95. So we can't work with these, so we want to transform that to the Z world. Okay, easier, much easier to do. So I remember my equation is I want to go from Z equals, now this is going to be X bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of N. Okay, I have to remember that I have to put a bar there. Last week, we didn't put a bar because X was the actual blood glucose. This is a mean of 30 people's blood glucose. Different thing completely. Cool. So I have to remember that. So I'm asking in that question, what is the probability that these sample means are less than or equal to 95? It is an equality. inequality. What I do to the left-hand side, I have to do to the right-hand side. So I write, and as far as the labs are concerned, please write this out by hand. I'll show you again the spreadsheet that you can use for your calculation, but please do this by hand in the labs for your own benefit. I'm going to have x bar, the sample mean, less than or equal to 95. What I do on the left-hand side of the inequality, I have to do on the right-hand side. On this side, I'm going to subtract population mean, so on that side, I have to subtract population mean. What does the population mean? 100. Okay, divide by, divide by. Divide by sigma. Sigma was 10. Divide by square root of n. Divide by square root of 30. I recognize this thing as z, the standard normal distribution. Mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. So I recognize this from my equation on this side, P, that Z is less than or equal to, okay, out to the calculators. Last week's calculators made many mistakes. When I rewatched that video, I, I noticed all the mistakes that the calculators made. So out to the calculator, I want minus 5 divided by 10 divided by square root of 30. Okay, oh, that's a nice one. Don't show it to me. <laughs> oh, I love calculators. Okay, who's doing, who's doing that calculation? Let's just get the same answer from a couple of people. Negative? Two, two point? Seven four. Seven four. Anyone else? Everyone happy with that one? Oh, I just see all these fancy calculations. Anyway, so me asking what is the probability that I, all these infinite sample means that I could possibly do if I woke up every day for a million days and I did that over and over again, I'm going to get a bunch of different means. What proportion of them will be less than 95? What probability? What proportion? Okay. Well, I do my little calculation. What I do on the left, I do on the right. I plug in my values. That thing, x bar being less than 95, is exactly the same question as z being less than or equal to negative 2.4. And I know z is very nicely behaved because the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. So it's a very nice one, and I can, it's easier for a table at the back of the book or for my computer to calculate this value. OK, everyone cool with that? So what I'm asking for here. There is all the possible means, and there was some distribution of them. By the central limit theorem, most of them will be around the real population mean. Okay, and if this thing was 100, I'm asking for what proportion of them will be less than 95. So what I asked, so can you see this is that little area under the curve? But I transform that, so from 100 I go to 0, and I'll have some stuff, so that's a horrible one. So negative 2 point, negative 2.74 is out here. I'm asking for that thing. Same thing. Everyone can see that. Very simple transformation. And we can't calculate that by hand, but I want you to get 
pencil on paper, pen on paper, and I want you just to at least get there. Okay, but I could also have asked what's the probability of being at least uh, 120 or between this value and that value. I don't like those between ones. They're so unrealistic. Can you see it's just last week, but a different setup. But I used the same mechanics as last week. So let's just check on this one that you have. So please, please be aware of at the bottom that you use the correct sheet because some, some people um, emailed me and they used the wrong sheet last week. So that's the one, the variable, if I just have this random variable x, this actual thing that I'm measuring, blood glucose. Okay, the other sheet says sample, and that's where I have the mean of a couple of blood glucose levels. Different thing, everyone can see that. So there's your sheet for, that you can use in the exam or anywhere. That first one at the top is just the z value transformation once again. So this one is at most, that one is at least, that one's between, so let's do that most. What was the sample mean, I'm asking you, um, less than 95, is that what I'm asking you? In this instance, let's put in 95 there. What was the population mean, turns out that was 100. What was the population standard deviation, that was 10. How many people was my study, well there were 30 people in my study. And there we go, negative two point, why do I get negative two point, yeah, negative 2.74. If I do three decimal places, I go, that's what I see. So negative 2.74, and you see there also the sample standard error. I've just divided by the square root of 30 in that block, okay? So this block here, I just put it in just for completeness sake, that 1.82, that is sigma, 10 divided by square root of 30, the standard error of the sampling distribution. Cool? But there's my z value. So 95 in the x bar world is equal to negative 2.7386 in the z world. Everyone cool with that? Yeah? And it turns out that that little area under the curve, the proportion of means that are at most 95 is tiny. It is only 0.003 or 0.3 percent of the area under the curve. Now listen carefully, this is what it means. If I could, by the frequentist approach to statistics, somehow do this a billion times over and get different means every time, less than 0.3 percent of them will be at most 95. It'd be very unlikely for me to find a mean that is 95 or less. Very unlikely. Okay, and that should be true because I told you this thing, the, the blood glucose is normally distributed by our example here. And 95 and 100 is kind of far away from each other. Okay, I, it should be much closer to 100. It should be unlikely that I find a value 95 or 94, 93, 92, 91, further out. Turns out it's very unlikely. It's 0 0.003 or 3 point something percent, 0.3 oh, percent. Everyone happy with that? Everyone happy with the spreadsheet? And if I were to ask you, well, what was the probability of finding a value that is more than, so let's do this one, let's do this one a bit closer. What was the probability or what proportion of these doing it an infinite number of times would be more than 101? Let's do something that's a bit closer. 101, population mean 100, uh, population standard deviation 10, my sample size 30, that gives me a standard error of 1.8, it gives me a z value of 0 0.54, and it turns out 29% of those doing it an infinite number of times, 29% of them would be 101 or bigger. Quite a substantial proportion of all these billions of sample means would be 101 or more some proportion of the total area under the curve. Is everyone happy with this? If you get this, you get statistics. It is that simple. It's this model of the world. This instance, it's a model of possible values that means can take. If I were to do this an infinite number of times, I would get this range of means. And I'm just asking what proportion of them will be at least this or at most that. Okay, cool. Done.
done. Questions, comments, concerns. Everyone can do this. See how simple statistics really is. Was this difficult? No? Oh, thank you for shaking. <laughs> I appreciate that one. Okay, any questions? Ask them now. So don't get confused when you get to the TAs now. I'm asking the actual blood glucose levels. When you go do your homework for next week about this work, I'm asking about the distribution of means of that thing. Okay. Now, we will talk about this again later. What if instead of I do all the means, I do all the variances? What would that look like? That's the other example that I just went past there um, on the Wolfram language. Turns out that's also nicely distributed. What about the standard deviation? That is also, but there's a little catch. The variance will be around the population variance. The standard deviation, not. The standard deviation is not, we call it, an, it's not a, it's a biased estimator of the population value. Whereas this thing is called an unbiased estimator. This X bar, it gets close to what the real population one is if my sample size is big enough. Okay. We call this thing an unbiased estimator of the population mean. The sample mean is an unbiased. Variance also, the variance is an unbiased estimator of the population variance. Standard deviation, not so much. Range, not at all. Okay. But all those statistics that I can calculate, they all have a distribution of possible values that they can take. The one that we care about is the mean, okay? And by the central limit theorem, it is going to be around the real population mean, if I were to do this many times over. And either I take 30 people at least every time, or the actual thing that I'm measuring is normally distributed. One of those two things must be true. Then I make use of what we call the central limit theorem which states that the, pop, the, the, the distribution of means will be nicely normally distributed. No questions. You get it. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> it's really, it's fun, huh? Come on. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for, for you as well. <laughs> okay, that's all. You can go have some coffee. I'm sure the TAs, are, they're not here yet. Okay, so not much different from last week. Quick and easy. Okay. <laughs>